You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hey, everybody. Oh, this looks like footage from the show you were at this past week. Hey, that's correct, Chris. Well, last Thursday, I decided to drop in on uh, the Silicon Valley Virtual uh, Reality Expo. It's been going on for some time. It's kind of a grassroots effort uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley. Uh, they had some heavy hitters there, but if you notice the, if you remember some of my static images from GDC, obviously the, the budgets weren't the same. Seems like a little traditional uh, expo. Uh, but like I said, there were some heavy hitters. And in this particular video here, I'm on a quest. Uh, and, you know, we'll see what that quest is in a moment. But uh, I'm using this new, and I don't remember the acronym, but, uh, or the model number for the Panasonic. But this is a 4K with a little inset video, as you can see there. So uh, I'm able to record it. The sad thing is, um, I didn't have enough time to order uh, what they call a DV pad attenuator for my line output. So I wasn't able to actually capture directly from my Zoom, which is what I normally do. So the audio in this is not very good, uh, especially from my end where I'm talking because I directed it at the, 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 what do you want to call it, the interview ease. So what we have here is another Sixth Sense booth. Now, as you notice, in the past, we uh, I have kind of kept track of them. And for somebody who doesn't have a product for almost three years, in four months, it will be three years, they seem to have spent a lot of money making sure that they've had uh, a visibility in all the expos, including GDC, which is quite expensive. I know that personally. So I decided at this one, I even actually sent out an email saying, hey, I'm going to be there. Why don't you do a little interview with me and kind of discuss that? So <clears throat> I call this episode, Where is Amir? Uh, and if you know, that's in reference to a kid's book series called Where's Waldo? And the reason I call it that is even though I had planned it, even though the person here, when I finally get a hold of somebody, says, well, he was supposed to be here. She kind of ironic that I asked him to be here at a particular time. He doesn't show up. So I asked, well, what about this update that's supposed to be coming out? He goes, oh, well, maybe that's what they're planning right now. Uh, so I don't know what the situation is. However, after we get done with you doing a little rundown what our show is going to be about, I'll kind of talk about where they're at and what they've done. And I really think it's outrageous. Maybe we'll get a voice of reason besides my emotional state to kind of calm me down because I think that they've made some decisions that I think have affected, as I call it, the torches in the courtyard by many of them. And this is uh, one of their employees that has been there on several occasions. Can you hear him? Steve. 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 It's a guy. <laughs> Not a company. <laughs> yeah. As far as I know, no one told me that we posted the announcement, but we do have to be actually, I can look myself. So would you ask him? Oh, you're very welcome. So what I asked him is, where's Amir? <laughs> I told him that uh, I had planned to be here about this time and hoping I would be able to do an interview with him. So that's when he indicated that, well, he might be planning with Steve, which if you remember is their what would you call it, their project manager or their marketing manager uh, who has sent me several emails. So then I go on, because obviously he wasn't there, onto the Ozo. So you were talking about another expensive product. Uh, this is the Ozo, which is a multi-camera, spherical camera uh, from, believe it or not, Nokia. And uh, it's about $50,000. But as you can see, it's very compact. So... Uh, I went through and had a discussion with actually one of the, the developers there, and he was trying to pawn me off, and I said, no, I don't have a lot of time. And uh, so all of this was in a real-time video that I had sporadic uh, 
bandwidth, so it's kind of spotty. But I also did this, which I'll jump to. By the way, let me bring this up. This was a little, <clears throat> little lead-in image that I created. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, uh, where's the mirror? <laughs> um, so here's the, the panoramic video. What? That's from your uh, little... Uh, um, V.360. Yeah. Yes. Sadly, I, I had forgotten that uh, the actual... You know, call it image area is up higher, so I had this at the same level as all my other cameras, so I didn't get uh, it's all kind of from a higher perspective. That's kind of the hard part about like products like that that don't have a screen on them, you know, like the GoPro is you don't actually you're it's all off the hip shooting, so you don't really know what you're shooting. Well, actually, I, I won't use that as an excuse. Um, you can partner this with a smartphone, sure. either an iOS or an Android. So I could have reviewed it. Right. Um, however, I was rushing to, to try and get this. But in saying that, it did, it did give me a fairly good perspective, almost like a little bird's eye. Now, if you remember, we've covered this V.360 in the past. The problem with the V.360, in my opinion, is it's a cylinder, and they kind of promised me that they were going to expand that cylinder. Uh, that has not happened, and what's it been, over a year now. So more than likely it will not. Uh, one that I have my eye on is the Theta S uh, by Ricoh, uh, which is a nice little compact, almost a little bit larger than a, a pack of, what do you want to call it, chewing gum. Wow. But as you can see there, um, we've had a few companies. You had NVIDIA. But again, remember, all of these booths are reminiscent of, a, of the earlier days of Expos. Nobody had anything big, including Oculus. Uh, they all had little tiny booths. Uh, more than likely, that's because this was the space of the Expo. wasn't that big. Um, luckily, I didn't have a lot of, or lucky, I didn't have a lot of time, so luckily the space wasn't that large. I wanted to do a few more interviews. Uh, I had the opportunity, but really didn't have the time that day. So let's see if I can actually, uh, for some reason, there we go. Let's bring it back. Uh, there is something here. This is kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know why they dressed up like a, a a man, an astronaut, but uh, probably to do I, the Mars thing. Yeah, that's possible. But this is, and then you can't see it here, but uh, my video that I did while I was there, the real time footage, uh, actually shows that he's on a what do they call it, multi moving uh, bed. So if that makes any sense. So yeah. you can move in any position. And, you know, the questions I had see this arm behind him here? Uh, this is, you know, I was thinking, okay, so you have all of your uh, sensors in this. And he said, no, the only thing we're looking at is, is the CG or a center of gravity and the vectors from that. So uh, this is more to, to make sure he doesn't fall on his face. Uh, but it also provides the, the information necessary for the, uh, uh, obviously, the sensors to be able to identify that you are walking around in a VR space. And uh, I asked, well, is there some sensors in the actual uh, platform? And he said, no, it's all in that arm. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, huh. I did not ask the price, um, but I do think that it's fairly pricey. It does look a little more polished than what I've seen in the past. Yeah, Stop I moving. think everybody's, everybody's getting, uh, you know, ramping up for the whole VR explosion that's happening right now. Yeah, I think so. On that note, any news on your Oculus? Well, we have a, for me, I've got a June, sometime in June, I think is what my ETA is on the, on the Rift. Hmm. Okay, well, one more That's month. That's better than never. That's right. Well, you'll yeah. get it. You yeah. know, what's interesting, one of the rumors are why... It uh, is not available yet, or it's slow to become available, is the, let me go ahead and stop my video here. 
um, is the Microsoft 360 uh, what do you want, hand units that they, the game pads that are included with it. Supposedly, again, this is a rumor that Microsoft did not have enough of them. So they've had to ramp up actually on the controller to make sure. To me, it's like um, we could kind of give you like a coupon or something to go ahead and get these out sooner. It just didn't make sense to me. So again, that was a rumor. Uh, I don't see why that would be an issue. However, I did find out because, as you know, I converted my DK2 uh, into something new. Um, you do need a gamepad or their controller, or you just can't operate it. You can't use a mouse. You can't use a keyboard. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Don't break your Xbox 360 gamepad controller. Okay, Chris, what do we got going on today? All right. Welcome, everybody. It's all things 3D. Today is May 6th. 2016. It's Week in Review. Thanks for joining us. We've got a lot of cool uh, updates, obviously. Um, we've got some stuff from Disney, some stuff from Lytro, the light field camera. Uh, Lulzbot had a big announcement this week. Uh, can't wait to get into that. And uh, of course, as usual, you stick around to the end and I'll give you some print tricks at the end with the print whisperer. Yes, I've already seen that you've got plenty there. I like the fact that you're actually adding a, a paragraph of what you're going to be talking about. So those in the show notes who miss it want to go directly to what you're actually watching the show for, those five to ten minutes of the print whisper. Um, you can actually see it in the show notes. All right, well, I'm going to move on to my the item that I've been talking about. And as mentioned, um, Sixth Sense had an announcement on April 29th. The day after I was there, ironic. Actually, it was the same day, so it's kind of funny how uh, even though I was there, they didn't announce it on camera. But let's read about it. So essentially, if you were a backer of the STEM system, they've done a few things. One, not too long afterwards, they say that this particular unit here, if you notice, uh, would not be available. Uh, the original design had five STEM units, and two of them were actually in the handsets. Well, guess what? Those two in the handsets now became permanent fixtures. So one of the things about Kickstarters is that you really can't alter your, uh, what do you want to call it, your... Pledge. You no, know, not your pledge, your, what are they, your levels of, geez, sorry about this, um rewards. Uh, so that's one thing that, you know, they've kind of violated. And in order to actually get the five removable STEM units, you have to buy two separate. So one of the reasons I went from 299 to close to 600 is that I bought the two extra. So again, this is actually a Kickstarter violation, even back when this occurred, that you can't modify your actual rewards at the time that the, or after the time that the, you've actually been funded. So that's one thing. So what is, what is the heavy heart about? Well, essentially, they've again identified that they've had delays in manufacturing. So it's been almost three years. You would think by this point that they would have had all this identified. It appears that that is not the case. The fact is that they're saying that they're going from wherever the original manufacturers back to the USA really concerns me um, because normally, as we'll find out later on, you go outside the USA if you want to be competitive. So I don't know what's happened here. I don't know if it's just an excuse. But again, it does seem that they are delaying once again, which is sad because, as you remember, Chris, I said I give them two the 1st of May. If not, I am pushing for a class action suit. So it seems my hands were tied there. Then, if that wasn't enough, they appear at the show, which cost money, several shows that cost money, but they also came out with this, the miniaturized STEM pack. How does a company who can't seem to get their original product out have time to create alternative products? I would think that you're somewhat under a budget if you can't provide refunds to those people that demand it. And maybe, as you said, Kickstarter, you can kind of kiss your money goodbye. 
but there is also plenty of pre-orders that were identified and they have also been denied refunds which is a different class uh, so how do you come up with this stuff how do you have time to design these things so my theory is they've realized that they have moved so far beyond the time that their devices would be important because as you know the HTC Vive has their controller oculus is soon going to have their own controllers so now they said well let's bring this into the mobile market which kind of makes sense but the problem is they've never actually completed their original stem system and some people have already are concerned that this again looks like a prototype it's an open design how the hell is this going to pass FCC so they can you to see a debacle now the interesting thing is and here's this new miniaturized system so they've actually devoted a lot of time to create a whole new package instead of refining the one that several thousand have purchased or pledged for right so I'm really concerned about that. Obviously, it's made a lot of people angry, and they're, you know, I'll use the proverbial torches and pitchforks, but really there are a lot of people that are extremely upset besides myself. So here they're talking about uh, how it was actually going to be shown off. It wasn't actually at the show when I was there. So maybe it was there on Friday, uh, April 29th. I was there on the 28th, so it may have been there. I don't know. I have not seen any footage other than what I see here. Um, but again, I feel this is just another slap in the face. Uh, at GDC, they announced a, either a partnership or a actual PC box uh, to work with the Oculus. So again, where are they coming up with all this money to come up with these other alternatives? Is it the money that us pledgers provided to them? I don't know. But again, Many people have asked for refunds. I asked for a refund during the time that my wife was getting brain surgery because I thought I might need the money. Was denied or actually was just completely ignored. Uh, there have been a number of other people that have been ignored or denied. And there was an open statement by Amir himself who identified we are not providing any refunds. So here you go. Here is the next unit. In fact, they identify if you want to forego your dev kit, and go to this we welcome you and then it's not even what's funny is another point that was brought out is the they now call the version that was supposed to be the consumer version now the dev kit so they've completely renamed it in order to provide a new product so as you know it's been almost three years many people pretty much at this point have either just said our money is gone which I had at one time. What, what's the steps of uh, grief? I don't know. Uh, I thought I was finished with this, but obviously when I saw that they're still attending shows and coming out with products, it, it kind of incited something into me. So Amir, if you're out there, um, please let us know what you're going to those do for those who are very upset and want their money back. And as mentioned, I have already moved forward and consulted an attorney to move forward with this class action suit. I think there is many justifications for doing that. I think the fact that you have spent so long uh, providing very obscure updates or just delays identifying when it will be out, and again, you did this on the 29th. Uh, I gave you an opportunity to come on the show. I had an opportunity to talk to you uh, to find out more and uh, for some reason I've actually invited you on this show uh, in 15 minutes so if you would I'd love for you to come back on talk about this please explain to us why you keep doing this to us you know I was very excited about it. if you remember Chris we saw this well, our first show together and uh, you know this is what I spent my money on something that hooks up to the Galaxy X I don't remember that's what I wanted, but it appears that's what our money is being spent on. Oh, well. <sighs> Take a deep breath, Mike. The grudge match on. continues. You know what? I'm looking at you, and my audience is, again, not seeing. They're just hearing my voice. No, so, I, mean, I, was, I was seeing you. We're seeing you. I know, but the problem is our audience doesn't see it. It only sees what I see on my screen, and again... 
I got So I'm going to run through it real quick. Again, I apologize. So here are the images. You can actually go out to the Kickstarter and look for yourself, their latest update. It appears not only are they delaying the original stem for a lot of angry backers, but they've come out with a brand new product. And my question is, how can you go to these shows and how can you come up with a new product which requires research and efforts um, when you haven't even actually finished the product you promised over two and a half years ago? So again, summarizing, I have invited uh, Amir on at 9.45. I hope that uh, he'll take my opportunity to come on. He has the Goa link, and uh, we'll see. Um, otherwise, uh, I guess I'll be a little bit more disturbed today. All right, on that note, Chris, why don't you move into our first news item? All right. Well, this one is pretty fun. This came to us uh, from Road to VR. Um, and it's Dexmo, an exoskeleton for you to touch the digital world. Dexmo has done this before, and they're doing it again. And this product, they have a video here, YouTube, showing uh, a little demo of Dexmo, which is a uh, looks like a 3D-printed haptic feedback system that goes on like a glove that's used in conjunction with VR. And it actually can produce forces resistant to your hands so you can actually uh it can feel like you're actually picking up objects or that you're touching things it's kind of experimental kind of cool um and i could see this really being used for a lot of different things obviously this is a prototype being shown in the video here they are like dismantling a fake bomb <laughs> and uh this is showing it in uh you know in VR, so it's sh it can actually track your hand, but also give real haptic feedback to your hand um, as a glove. It's like a little glove. And obviously, there will be more of these doodads that go onto your arms and your legs or what <laughs> whatever. Uh, but here it is showing motion tracking again. And uh, Now, you see what's over there on the right-hand side, right? Now... One of the reasons I think many people backed Sixth Sense is they came up with another product called the Hydra. And if people are familiar with that, that was that little ball. So it appears they're, they're in conjunction with their own, uh, what do you want to call it, hand devices, their spatial uh, positioning is done by the Hydra. Don't know if you notice that there. A nice little unit. A lot of people liked it. Uh, they teamed up with, uh, what's their names? Jeez, uh, can't think of it right now. It'll come to me, but essentially it's a big uh, gaming company. Uh, and I think it was a very popular product, which I think is one of the reasons why people back the STEM. So, and, uh, so you can find out more about Dextra, Dexta, sorry, no R in there. It's Dexta Robotics. You can find out more about them at DextaRobotics.com and read about it. Where are they located at? Um, you know, that I don't know. Um there we go. About us. Uh-oh. <laughs> mm. Yeah, not sure. But this is like some screen grabs of the screenshots of their uh, of the actual glove product that they've been prototyping, Dexmo. So <laughs> dextarobotics.com. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Very interesting. Okay, well, another big item in the news, and there have been plenty of them. You may have seen this. MakerBot is moving all its manufacturing to China. You know, what's funny is that I think, if I remember correctly, some of the manufacturing was already done in China, and the assembly process was done in the United States. If I remember, I think their electronic board was done by a company in China. But um, obviously, this is some hard news for the people in the, where was it, Brooklyn? Yeah. Yeah, Brooklyn, New York because uh, obviously they'll be losing their jobs unless, I guess, they could move to China and work for <laughs> one-tenth the price. Yeah, I don't think that's happening. No, don't think so. Um, there are some, several other articles on it. I have my own take on it. Um, as I mentioned already, this was just the next evolution. I think already most of their manufacturing for, let's say, the electronic board was done outside the United States. This was just an assembly process. 
uh, as sadly, uh, it's very difficult to compete in this country uh, uh, on manufacturing. And uh, not just in China, there are many other countries, Vietnam, Taiwan, uh, even Mexico and South America. I mean, it, it's an, an international situation. And uh, you know, if you're going to compete, but personally, my opinion, MakerBot made a horrendous mistake by putting out a product that, in my opinion, was unfinished. It created a lot of grief for a number of people. As you can see in this image here, the, the case, the outer appearance was very professional. As you know, many, like the Luzbot, even though it's a fantastic printer, still looks um, industrial. And one of the things that MakerBot, I think, did a great job with is creating a very finished looking product. The sad thing is, if the internals don't work properly, it's just a nice looking paperweight and a large paperweight at that. And personally, moving it to China, I don't think is going to help them. And as I, sadly, as you're probably aware of, not everybody's going to get into this. Uh, it's still fairly expensive. There's still a high learning curve. I think that is more the issue. It's one of the reasons why they've moved back into the educational or concentrated on that uh, in the universities. Uh, one, as you know, sometimes you can charge more for that, and, but maybe they have found that there's enough competition in that area. The other thing is, uh, as we're both aware of, there are companies like Flash Forge, uh, one, two, three, that have kind of beat them to the game. And they've come out yeah. with some excellent products um, that, you know, aren't industrial quality, but are great consumer products. And they've partnered with some good slicers now uh, to provide a very reasonable. If you remember, James bought a Flash Forge and has been very happy with it at about one third the cost. So, well, in the homemaker market, I mean, this is it's all speculation on why they're having so many uh, problems, you know, as a as a company. But, you know, I know for the, the maker movement is like embracing the, the open source. And they had this huge backlash when they went away from the open source. They kind of spit in the face of a lot of the people that had contribute contributed in the beginnings. Obviously, there was that whole uproar that happened. So, mm -hmm. you know they're all competing for market share. And when you're weighing machine to machine to machine, you're weighing Lowell's bot versus a maker bot versus a flash forge versus a, a Ultimaker, right? Mm -hmm. They each have pros and cons, but the maker bot really doesn't come out on top on anything. And, no. the, and when they, when they went to this corporate, you know, when they were bought out by Stratasys, I think they were so swept up in kind of this corporate takeover and getting a huge cash injection that they forgot how to innovate and they forgot like you know you see you see what ultimaker's doing and you see what lulzbot's doing and you see what a lot of these other companies are doing and they're they're constantly improving their product and constantly and they're 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 not uh backing themselves into a corner you know and i don't know makerbot seems seems to a, a lot of ways has has backed themselves into a corner um and just they really haven't brought anything new to the table and I think a lot of that is because they're proprietary hardware and they're proprietary software and they have, you know, so they, they went away from their roots. Yeah. And that's a very good point, Chris, is that the, the term proprietary, uh, once, once they were bought up by Stratasys, you know, that seemed like a very negative in a lot of people's opinion, but I saw it as a positive because then they would have access to a, boatload of patents and be able to introduce some uh, novel or I should say patented features that what they could only do with the Stratasys. I think the removable print head was an example of that. The problem is it just didn't translate um, so quickly. I don't think they did enough uh, fine tuning, a lot of research, and more importantly, a lot of testing. Uh, and they were caught with, I guess, as they would say, their pants down with that. The other thing is their units have been expensive. And if you compare them to other units like the uh, Luzbot. Uh, why would you choose a product more expensive and as you indicated, that doesn't function properly? It just, it doesn't, it's crazy. Um, one other point that you didn't mention and one of the reasons I think you went with the Luzbot, the Luzbot loves its owners, which means like you, you have purchased two of them. 
you have feedback. They have a great forum to talk about all that. And uh, that's, I think, very important. Ultimaker is another. Ultimaker is fairly expensive as well, as I've, I've shown and uh, presented on the show before. But again, they have a great user interaction. Right. And they introduce that, as you'll see um, in one of my other posts on our show today. Ultimaker loves its, you know, I want to call them owners, but the recipients of their product. And they show that. Lowsbond is another great example. I'm thinking those in the, uh, the industry that have worked towards the top are those that have embraced their audience and take the feedback from their audience to create new products. And I'm using that as a segue, Chris. Don't we have a new product out there from a company called Lozba? We do indeed. May 17th it comes. The Lulzbot TAS 6 was unveiled, uh, let's see, day before yesterday. And uh, not a lot different, but obviously they have a, a dual head, a dual fan shroud on the on the on um, their new head assembly, a little bit different bearing mounts. And then they've also got uh, this nice sheet metal enclosure and then they've got the auto bed leveling functionality that they built in, that they bake into the uh, Lil Spot Mini. And that's just what we know so far. I'm sure there's some uh, some other tweaks that they've done that we get to find out about on their unveiling on the 17th. But you can go get a little sneak peek of the Lil Spot. Um, the Lil Spot TAS 6, you can go get a little sneak peek over at their website. Um, this has been a long time coming. Can't wait to get my hands on one. Very uh, awesome. So essentially, they've incorporated many of the features that are in the Mini, but in a more sturdy, large bed like your TAS 5. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's essentially the same thing as a TAS 5, but just with a lot of the features like the auto bed leveling. The, the, the carriage and everything is the same as the TAS. It's just... it's this. They just what they're doing, what they what I've noticed that they've been doing, and you can look at all their CAD drawings on their development server. So if you have SolidWorks, you can actually open their SolidWorks files. They furnish them to the public, even when they're developing in beta and alpha the models. And you can actually check this whole thing out, take it apart, spin it around, and see what the differences might be. I think another thing is that so another feature that the Lulzbot Mini has is they've got the uh, Cable carriages, really nice. You know, everything's kind of tucked up in these. Uh, the the um, cable chains, mm -hmm. you know, so really nice. And and so they're incorporating that into the new design. It looks like, uh, yeah. So it's just they're basically just building on an already great printer that's already arguably the best printer on the market right now, consumer grade. And they've just they've just basically stepped it up a, a, a little baby step at a time they're just doing little iterations of it and that's i think a really good formula for success because i think i think lulzbot's really been selling a lot of these units hmm. um well if i in the market for another printer i might look into that you know disney's known for magic right yes yeah um, so I saw this and I thought, oh my gosh. And the reason I say, oh my gosh, is that uh, 3Ds.org uh, by Kira wrote about this, but it seems like she kind of, or he, I don't know if it's he or she, just kind of re, what do you want to, I want to say regurgitated the news that Disney provided them. So I thought I'd do a little bit of investigation on the actual patent. So here's the idea. They take a light source, they shine it at an object, they reflect that light into a, what do you want to call it, a, a tub, <laughs> a chamber of light-sensitive resin, and they rotate both objects, which hardens the resin. Does that make sense to you? So I thought about this, and I said, okay, seems like that wouldn't work too well. And one of the things that they don't really show in this illustration here is that if you remember, we've talked about volumetric um, slicing that is done in uh, 
MRIs and CTs. Well, this is kind of like that technique that uh, you sign a light source that is controlled. Now, my thinking is that this light source not only has an on-off period, but it also has an intensity period. So that way they can increase the light at a inner surface and then decrease it in order to harder the exterior surfaces and then rotate the object. Uh, they do this by, which is not shown here, let's see if they show it down here, uh, not really, but uh, not only do you synchronize the rotation of the object, so think of it like a copying machine, but uh, you also uh, have a mirrored system that focuses uh, dynamically as well. So it's, it's fairly complicated, but I thought what was pretty cool is it kind of brings back the days of analog <laughs> recording because essentially you're just using the source item to provide the information necessary to create your product. So what would this be good for? I don't know. Are they going to have a little place at Disney where a kid brings in his little toy and gets a magic replica of it in a few minutes? Um, I don't see the potential on this since literally you have to have the original object in order to provide a duplicate. Uh, it does not look like there is a technique to take a digital file and create something. So what do you think, Chris? You want one of these? Pretty interesting. Uh, and here's I the actual patent. I think it's interesting. I don't know if I want one, but we'll see where it goes. Yeah, we'll see. Um, the, the thing that I wonder is, and we talked about this before, I see a lot of vague terminology. I see a lot of vague illustrations. But as we've talked about before, the patent system doesn't require that you actually bring in a product, I think at one time they did, or a prototype to show it actually in operation. So my question is, does this thing exist? Is this just somebody's idea? What, what do they have? You know, all I'm seeing is patents. And, and you know, that really concerns me when you have so many patents out there, yet you may not actually have a tangible device or even, let's say, a logical device that actually describes it. So here's one of the illustrations showing the mirrored system, the light sources uh, being reflected into a concave uh, lens system to focus back on it. Uh, but again, unless you have the original item, I don't see how useful this would be. You know, what are they planning to have do some type of manufacturing with a ton of these? Uh, as you know, resin is not that cheap, so it's not like they're going to be saving anything. I don't know. just seems very odd. And here again is the volumetric slicing. So even though they called it, it's not a slicing diet device, it obviously appears that they are using uh, layers in order to create the product or the copy. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Again, some more Disney magic, I guess. Um, but if you want <laughs> more on this, you can go out to our show notes, which will have the link to the 3Dears.org article as well as a link to the patent itself. Uh, Awesome. All right, Chris, what else do we have? Well, we have another uh, Kickstarter that I, uh, from a company that we know, um, Polymaker, has launched PolySmooth and Polisher 3D prints without layers. It's a new print system. Well, it uses your existing 3D printer with a special filament that you print with made by Polymaker, and it puts it into uh, basically this device, and I think it's about a, let's see, I think it's about Chris, a two, yeah. Could I stop you for a moment? Sure. I'm a little worried about you. Have you been checked what? for Alzheimer's? <laughs> did you know, we cover we, talk, we covered this, but we did. it's good. It's a great segue because it gives me an opportunity to correct myself. Polymaker is the company that makes Polymax, which I think is a superior PLA. And I just wanted to make that note. So it is the same company. They're extremely innovative. And it looks like they've successfully well, um, exceeded their pledge. Looks like somebody's a backer. Who would that yeah. be? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I uh, I back this um, just to try it out, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But apparently they have a nebulizer that nebulizes alcohol particles and is able to smooth your prints without the use of acetone. So you don't need to worry about, like, nasty uh, fumes, and you just use isopropyl alcohol, and it smooths your prints out. So if you need real fine surface finish FDM parts or FFF parts, this is a good route to go. Check it out on Kickstarter. Yep, and you've got 19 days. I've got a, and it's actually, remember I told you, I said, well, if the price point is more than 200, if you got in early, it was actually 200. So uh, hats off to them for creating a, what it looks like, a great looking product uh, at a reasonable price. And as you mentioned, it does require a unique material, and their materials are a little bit more expensive, but well worth it, in my opinion. So very cool for bringing that up again. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of slack on your Alzheimer's. This time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that about covers our 3D and technology. So let's move into dun 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 dun, dun 3D design and architecture and engineering. Woo. Woo oh boy! All right, let's see what we got here. Well, I thought this was cool, and you know, it's actually more about 3D technology, but it is design efforts. Somebody. As you know, we just talked about how Ultimaker um, works really well with its audience, its buyers. And this was uh, written by Sander, who we've had on the show before. And uh, what Sander uh, has written about is about a company, or actually, I don't know if it's a company or a guy, but it's called ColorPod. Essentially, by changing out or actually adding to the current print head, the guy has added inkjet. Right? <laughs> technology to it, which allows them to provide color as it's printing. So I guess the droplets. So Perfect here, example of making open source hardware that and where why innovation happens with open source a lot faster is right here. Yep. Perfect example is you get people tinkering that want to push the limits and push it even further. And there you go. Yeah, and obviously the you know, let's see if we can. Oh, it's talking about 3DP. So I guess in the 90s somebody has done with sand and plaster. All right, so let's stop that and actually look at the full color 3DP from the color pod. So there it is in operation. Can you see it there? So, totally agree with you. And the, the cool thing about open source is because you have access to a great number of uh, information processes that are being done, uh, let's say in this case the Ultimaker, it makes it very easy to design for it because you don't have to reverse engineer anything. It's all there for your taking, proverbial taking. I think there's some obviously some exceptions you can't go out there and completely duplicate the ultimaker um, you have to provide uh, uh, identify who uh, created what you know it's a standard open source uh, verbiage uh, attribution yeah, license thank you chris wow look at this thing go well, it's a time lapse, so. Yeah, I know, but like, it's still fun to watch. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, we have those very, those, those little, what do you want to call it? Uh, those mini spatulas with a very thin edge. At least yeah, that's what I can tell Yep. Uh, but that used like a hair pick. So there you go. <laughs> it's making a smurf. Yeah. Coating it with hairspray. So what? it's interesting. I don't know what material it is. Um, but, uh, <laughs> well, if you want to do full color, it looks a lot like uh, the process used by uh, Shapeways to do their you know, these little things here, like the one I've got here. Um, right, a Z-Corp. Yep. Oh, wow, pretty neat stuff. 
And so if you've got an Ultimaker and want to do color, you might want to look into that. All right, Chris, next item. Well, Anything we already covered the whole spot task six coming on May 17th. Okay. Looking forward to that. So, we'll so I jump guess right we're into in uh, 3D, 3D in medicine. medicine. Now, this one I think is pretty cool. Um, this actually I like because it deals with robots, and we all love robots. Yeah. Ars Technica did this article, and, and then I found another. Uh, let's see if I've got it here. Let me make sure. Or did I? It reminds me of Prometheus. <laughs> um, actually, I do have another PDF, so I'll bring that up as well while we're talking. So essentially, yeah, that's <laughs> a good point. Prometheus, I was thinking of Star Wars, but yeah, I guess uh, Prometheus comes to mind in a very violent way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just makes sense. So what's the 3D component of this? Well, it doesn't really give you a lot of information here other than it uses a robot to st stitch soft tissue. Here is the actual tissue uh, being set up in order to provide it. It provides far more accurate um, incision, not incisions, uh, closure than a surgeon. Uh, currently, it's only being done on animals, in this case, a pig. But um, let me find it real quick. So give me a moment. Moment. Uh, here we go. So if you can see that. So essentially what I wanted to bring up is this little image here. This is, used, this is a Nerf system, which is already being used in surgery. But then notice the 3D point cloud. So they digitize, 3D scan the area, and they provide a point cloud that provides even more accurate three-dimensional information because, as you notice, nerve systems um, only provide markers. But now they have a full uh, 3D model of the tissue, and then they can then utilize that to determine uh, these nerve points and the deformation of the actual tissue itself, as what you can trip. see here. So... You know, what's important in a number of autonomous vehicles, um, in this case a surgical arm, is the ability to see things three-dimensionally and be able to map out your depth information without some of the devices uh, that we've talked about before. Uh, remember the thing that uh, a Kickstarter for the LiDAR systems? Uh, which is a significant portion of the Google autonomous vehicle. If you didn't have these kind of sensors, none of this would be useful. So AI is not good if you don't have any way of determining what the real world consists of. Uh, otherwise, it's like a brain in a box. I think there's a, a uh, philosophical process uh, study about would you be able to think if you didn't have any sensors or something like that. Um, I'm probably, well, the allegory of the cave, that was Plato's favorite, out, or that, that was the famous allegory of the cave where, you know, if you're born in a cave and all you see is shadows from fire being cast over humans, if you're like a prisoner in a cave and you were there, you know, born in that cave and all you knew is two-dimensional, uh, you know, two-dimensional shadow castings and then you were brought outside but then brought back inside to tell the people who are still in there they would have no ability to comprehend you know what's really going on outside you're like no there's these things there's 3d going on outside and they're like no we don't that no you're making that up you know i think we're going to have to add a another word to the title print whisper <laughs> Something like the, the guru of print whispering. The print philosopher. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, well, totally agree with you. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you don't have the information, you can't do anything with that information. Sure. If you have no way of sensing it. So there's a 3D component in that. It uh, actually is going to sneak in like uh, microcontrollers did into uh, our microwaves and other you know, very simplistic items. I think 3D scanning, digitizing, and depth information is going to sneak in as well as the costs come down. Everything's going to have a little LiDAR unit in it. Yeah, it'll have a LiDAR cap. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just... 
a lighter about. watch. Yeah. Okay. So that's about it. Uh, that article was from Ars Technica, and in the show notes will be a link to the actual PDF article that you can look at and enjoy on your own time. Chris, next item, please. Okay. Well, this is probably my biggest item for the day. Lytro. This was sent to okay. me by a buddy. So of mine. are we done with medicine? We're done with medicine. Okay. So then let's bring up the scanner darkly section. So okay. this is our section scanner. that we talked about scanning technology. So Lytro, we've talked about Lytro a few times. They have a few different models of camera on the market, but they've just announced Lytro Cinema. And you really to understand how it works. So, so Lytro makes these light field cameras that essentially where you, when you take an image, it's not actually imaging like with a CCD, like normal cameras. It actually is taking light field information and you can actually adjust the focus after the fact. So you can actually like take a photo. And so they've, they've built this whole line of cameras um, over the, the past couple of years. And we've talked about them on our show, but now they have this new one called Lytro Cinema. It's a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar camera, so this is not for this is not for jokers here. Um, and I'm, uh, but but you can head over to uh, lytro.com/cinema and you can check this thing out. You got to watch the video for yourself. But basically, what it does is it it basically like three D scans the entire environment. And it basically takes like depth information of the whole scene and offers tools for, uh, you know, compositing effects artists and CG artists or whatever. And you can actually fully, uh, you can, you can adjust the scene after the fact. So you can shoot a scene and you can actually, uh, zoom in after the fact you can adjust your, uh, focal points after the fact. So it gives a lot of flexibility. So rather than being boxed into a corner, if you're shooting a movie or shooting for, for cinema, you know, rather than being boxed in a corner after the fact, you, you know, you're, you hey, here's the footage. The footage normally is what it is. Well, with this, you can now, uh, you can now adjust it. And here you can see the video if, if for those people watching people watching the, uh, kind of some of the possibilities with the visual effects because you're you get this 3d data that you can actually it makes the workflow a lot easier super cool you know what's funny is when they first came out with that little tiny one i think it was like 600 400 600 dollars something like that i immediately thought of this since you're actually capturing different points in the the depth of an object, you should be able to take that and create mesh information. Obviously, that has translated here, obviously, at expensive price, but yeah, pretty cool. Light fields, I think, are the are the next thing up and coming. Obviously, this is a light field captured. Oitoy has something similar to this that allows you to capture depth information and be able to rotate around it. Uh, the, the point to keep in mind, though, is that these scenes are all captured from one viewpoint. So even though you've captured the depth information from one viewpoint, uh, it's still static from that perspective. Uh, in order to provide, obviously, a full 360, you'd have to take multiple snapshots around an object and then stitch them together. So, so here's, another, here's another another advantage of this system is basically it's going to do away with green screens because, because your depth it's all depth related and the camera can actually sense the depth of everything it's shooting. This is an example here. They basically can extract the forefront objects from the background. The foreground objects can be extracted very quickly, very easily from the background. And basically you can generate green screen effects without having to put them in a green screen. Well, even, yeah, even more detail is that you're not only capturing, because that's what they call a two-dimensional mat, um, you could actually capture multiple mats. So you could have multiple objects uh, in the scene at different points uh, appear. So you would always know 
And uh, the other thing that's very important in green screen matting is that they put markers in order to show in the green screen environment where you're at in three-dimensional space. That may not be necessary as well. You could just have the standard green screen and then the camera itself will provide the depth information so that you could add objects at different locations. Super cool. How much again for the camera though? I think it's about 125000 for the camera. Yeah. And um, it'll do up to 300 frames per second, 755 raw megapixels. So it's a huge, I mean, and 16 stops of dynamic range. So, I mean, it's a cinema. This is a cinema quality, quality camera that can compete with even the best of them. Um, yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Oh, well, new technology costs money, I guess. <laughs> Okay, well, here's some old technology for a change in our Scanner Darkly section. This actually isn't news, sort of, but I think it's probably the, at least it's the first evidence that I have found. Back in 1816, a, and I don't speak French, so if I get this wrong, sorry, uh, what, Francois Willem? I'm probably speaking German there, but um, he is a, French artist back in the year 1860 who created a novel technique in order to obtain information to create sculptures at a fraction of the time done by the standard sculpting technique. And here they show the process um, where they have an object, it creates slices, gee, sound familiar, of a kind of the pattern silhouette of the object and then you just use that all the way around an object and then you just cut out the uh, the relief of that silhouette and then you have the the start of your sculpture so here they show all the cameras in use and that information translates into this little device right here to be able to chisel it out. Now they did say that it doesn't capture all the uh, nuances of the the individual but it gives them a head start and they were able to substantially reduce the amount of time like they were able to actually start sculpting in days actually have a sculpture in days and, and as you know if you've done any sculpting it can take a long time especially with large figures. So I thought that was kind of cool that back in 1860 Somebody had already come up with a technique to create 3D scanning. Another thing, it's funny, do you remember The Matrix? Yeah, of hmm. course. Who could forget? Well, remember Bullet Time? Mm hmm. Kind of funny. You put oh, yeah. the green yeah. screen and then put cameras behind it. So, what are they? What's this saying? You know, everything has its roots, or I don't know, I'm coming up with stuff now. But essentially, nothing is ever new. It's just regurgitated and changed to meet our needs for today's modern time. This is a perfect example of that. So. Well, iPhones are kind of new. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> I've got a... I've got... No, that'll be next week. How they have these... No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. True, but, I mean, did the principle of iPhones, you know, you have a Motorola chain or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows? But I thought this was pretty cool. It was actually a an actual product. Uh, it was actually in use. So I consider it the first use of scanning technology. And this guy here was the first scanning technician. Oh, just my two cents there. All right, Chris. Next item. Okay. Hulu. This comes from Mashable.com. Hulu is partnering up with Live Nation for oh, VR. Hang on. We're in VR cornering around room, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Okay. So with that. Hulu is partnering you, up with Live Nation for VR concert series. Check it out. Hulu is going to join up with Live Nation, who is one of the largest uh, ticket um, sales companies. And they are partnering up to offer special behind-the-scenes VR experiences and front-row 
uh, seats to some of the hottest shows, you know, touring across the U.S. And so they are they off they they launched Hulu actually launched their VR app in March, and I haven't even had a chance to check that out. Obviously, I don't even have any um, current VR hardware, so that's why I'm waiting for my Oculus. Um, but and they they also have uh, already published some content. Apparently, um, there's some content called the Path, like meditation type stuff that you can check out. And uh, they're they're planning on a lot of a lot more VR content. So Hulu is definitely um, coming out strong with the VR content, and they're joining up with Live Nation to offer access to concerts worldwide. Where where can you view this at? As you'll find out with your Oculus device, they are kind of have a closed ecosystem. So do they provide a channel or an app within they the have Oculus? A, they have a VR app. Um, that's for that's a Hulu VR app. Yeah. Okay. So, but is it in the Oculus ecosystem? I'm uh, not sure about that, but I'm sure if we did a quick Google, we could figure that out. Well, that'll be important as you'll find out. And one of the things many of the uh, people who have backed Oculus in the past is that they've kind of closed and created their own wall garden. So one of the complaints is that none of the Google YouTube stuff is available in Oculus. And I think well, they show might right on their they show right on their website a, a Gear VR. So, um, mm, well, that's okay. So it might be Gear VR, um, but it may not be um, Oculus. Okay, so it is in the Oculus Store. Yeah. So, okay, that was, but uh, it's only for the Gear VR. So you won't be able to use it with your Oculus. Currently only supported on the Gear VR. Yep. But we will find Which means out. you have to have a Samsung phone. And you have to have a Samsung Gear VR in order to enjoy that. And this, again, has been a major gripe that we're creating these wall gardens, a la Apple. And uh, if you don't have all the right stuff, you won't be able to utilize it. Now, obviously, there are a lot of ingenious people working ways to get around it. Um, but uh, keep that in mind that as you buy your products, either the HTC Buy, the Sony PlayStation, or uh, the, the Oculus desktops, you need to make sure you're aware of the ecosystems that you're involved in. I personally feel... A, and I've actually got an opportunity to try the Oculus um, last week. Super cool. You're going to love it. It is extremely lightweight. I was surprised. The images don't do justice. It actually is very lightweight, very compact. Um, the optics are good. The screen is decent. Uh, if you want more of a breakdown, I think I showed it last week. iFixit did a great breakdown of it, as well as the HTC Vive. I felt the HTC Vive, which I've also seen, is heavier. Seems a little less polished, uh, but it has the Steam um, store. And as you know, Steam has been very popular in the PC gaming market. So uh, we'll see. Obviously, competition is good, I guess. Okay, on to somebody else who likes to provide VR. And that's a company called Google. And as you know, Google came out with this very innovative VR product, Viewer, called Cardboard, which literally was made out of cardboard. So Popular Science did an article interview with the, the guy that now heads up uh, the uh, VR section, Clay Baber. Baber uh, apologize if I said his name wrong. But uh, they kind of went through, and there wasn't a lot of information in this article. Um, but it does identify that uh, Google thinks a lot about VR. They're not really pursuing augmented reality or AR. And uh, they see opportunities here. And one of the things that they notice is that it's very important that people have VR on the go, meaning a mobile experience. But they realize phones were made specifically for being a phone or texting or something like that. And not necessarily what do you want to call it, uh, 
optimize for virtual reality or VR viewing. So that is something that I personally feel uh, is going to be announced at Google I.O. that there will be more, uh, what do you call it, kernel or low level um, optimization that will go on in phones. Uh, they may have a new, uh, what they call HAL or hardware extraction layer that uh, companies can follow in order to support VR uh, and improve on it. So it's kind of like the Gear VR, but for the, in, the entire Android market. So uh, look for that. I think that's gonna be very cool and essentially provide optimized VR experiences on your phone. Now, if you're an Apple person, I don't know how well that will translate. They've been very sluggish in improving and providing uh, Google Cardboard compatibility. It was just recently that the Google SDR Cardboard SDK was available for I.O. or excuse me, iOS, I think within the last month. Uh, so hopefully either Apple comes up with their own solution because they have their uh, developers conference coming up WWDC and we may see more there as well so as you said already Chris VR is the thing to look at now Definitely. okay all right so I actually have one more item and this I thought was very interesting HTC shares plummet so their stock went from down tremendous because there was a report uh, one, their stock earnings obviously weren't where they wanted them to be. But more importantly, it appears this is really weird, and I need to do a little more research. Cher or Chair Wang, one of the co-founders and current CEO of HTC, has set up another company to handle the development of HTC's VR. And what's funny is that not only have they set up this other company, uh, which the chairman is Chair Wang, but one of the co-founders of HTC has also come aboard, and their physical location or address is in the HTC main headquarters building. I think it says the ninth floor, which I thought was very odd. So obviously, this does not bode well for the company HTC, who um, is struggling right now because uh, their phones, even though supposedly the HTC 10 um, has great reviews, it's not being snapped up, especially in the market they were hoping, which is China. Because China, as you know, also creates some pretty good phones. And uh, you know, there's another company called, let's say, Apple, who is really working hard to introduce their phones into China. So what we may be seeing is HTC, the company, might be downturning but only to revive, as they say, the Phoenix as the HTC VR business. And why would that happen? Because as you know, HTC partnered uh, with Valve in order to create the Vive. And uh, the Vive has done extremely well, as we've shown on the show before. Uh, and uh, we'll probably see a lot more from that perspective. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you do that. You open up but I guess you can maybe in Taiwan. I don't know. Chris, you got any feedback on that? No, I think that, yeah, I don't know. HTC, I don't understand where how they could possibly uh, be in financial troubles when they just put up $100 million last week for VR development. So I'm not really sure. Like, you know, I think shares plummeting. Again, my take is, is that the stock market is nothing more than a baseball card trading game. After an IPO is released, the stocks are out there and we're merely trading stocks amongst ourselves. That money's never really getting, unless there's a buyback of the stock or a reissue of stock, then that money really has no effect on the company. But the chairman of the companies obviously own massive amounts of shares. So they do want to jack the prices up as much as possible if they're going to sell them, right? So share price is kind of a terrible indicator of a company's performance in my eyes. I, yeah, I don't think it's, it shows real performance of a company or, or does it well, show? What it does show is the how the public is perceiving the company. So Yeah, the value have, of the shares of the company, that's all it really right. is. Or if you have massive uh, uh, 
uh, buy-offs or selling of a particular share that shows that you know there might be some fear that the company's not doing well. Um, there has been a lot of concern about their phone business, and they may have noticed that hey, you know maybe VR is where we should be at. Obviously, we've got a hit on our hands, and let's pursue that. As you said, yeah, where do you come up with a hundred million dollars? Um, don't know, but maybe again, this might be that new company's incubator and not the HTC. Good point. Oh, well. Um, so that's about it for VR in a corner in a round room. And let's go right into spelunking in the tech cave. I'll make it really quick. I had an opportunity to speak at Stanford to a class they set up. Uh, it's a an interesting curriculum for a number of the student um, medical students at Stanford to talk about 3D fabrication. And uh, I worked with another guy, but I wanted to cover how virtual reality, and I've kind of created a new acronym called VAMR, V-A-M-E-R, which is Virtual Augmented Mixed Reality. Um, and I talked about each of these and gave some interesting examples. Um, I did this as a 360. So, as you can see here, you can pan around. There I am, and talking about uh, the different things. I showed two examples. One, uh, my own version. Let's see if I can jump to it. I call him Skinny Pete. But here it shows me actually, yeah, you might not be able to see the screen. Let's see. But uh, I showed the bridge engine, which we have talked about before from occipital, that allows you to scan an area, and there you go, and then put accurately models in the space that you just scanned so that you can literally create rock stable um, AR objects in the standard real world. So I created a model called Skinny Pete for obvious reasons and was able to actually walk around it get up close to it as you can see there and uh, the lovely woman on the left hand side there is you know who yeah. oh, this little character um, but as you can see there I, I did some things like um, ambient occlusion I baked that in but here as you can see I'm walking around and looking at this object So again, on my iPad, it looks like that object is in the room with us. So what I feel is the power of virtual reality and augmented reality is to create objects that have all the characteristics of a tangible object, but they don't exist. Uh, so one, they can be done fairly quickly. And two, um, you can share them with anybody around the world. So multiple people can have access to the same object. And as you talked about earlier, the new haptic gloves that are coming out that allow you to manipulate with your hands and actually translate pressure, you don't really need to have a tangible object anymore. And as I've shown actually in my, uh, this demo in the, sh in the show notes, if you want to watch this yourselves, you can go out there and take a look at it. You, uh, you can utilize this for surgery. So if you put on a 360 panoramic camera on your head or a fixed location in a room, there's an example I showed, you could have that being shown by a ton of people. And uh, you can actually have surgical assistance as we've talked about previously in shows. So talked about a, a lot of things, what each of those are, meaning virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, my opinion, or my definitions of, because I've worked with it for a couple of years now, of what they are and how you can perform them. I did a OR surgery demo as well as the new bridge engine augmented reality or mixed reality demo. And both of those are done in the 360 Splendor. And there is my audience and there I am again. So if you have nothing better to do, you could spend about 20 minutes reviewing that. So the other thing I want to bring up, I have decided to work on another little product. I call this the NeoDVR Ultimate Play. 
And essentially what makes it ultimate is I use a new 50 millimeter Fresnel lens and with built-in caps to protect the lens, but also they provide blinders. One of the things that I have noticed with um, VR devices is that it's difficult to isolate yourself from the outside world. So you can cup yourself or create it the cardboard, but to create a foldable compact design, you don't have that. So what I did is by providing dual purpose here, lens protectors that open up and provide blinders so that helps isolate your experience. Your forehead, I found out, kind of helps block the upper portion. So these devices that show something up on the upper, I don't think are as practical as having something on the sides. Uh, but like the previous play, it folds up. And uh, like I said, it uses very large lenses. And it's like looking into a space. And it's pretty cool. And uh, I will have a new prototype done soon. And then once I verify the design of it, like I've done with the previous plays, I will make it available in our favorite location for putting things like this, which is Umagine. So if you want to print this yourself, it'll be available. I will also make it available uh, at no extra cost if you want to print these through Shapeways. Um, so again, for those of you who are interested in a very cool VR. Now this one will be designed specifically for uh, larger screens, 5.7 to 6 inch screens, so that you can get the most ultimate experiences. So if you had the new um, S6, or not S6, X6, excuse me, S7 Edge or the new Note 6 that's coming out or previous Notes or any of the large screen devices like the Nexus 6, this will work perfectly for it. Uh, sadly, with the smaller phones, uh, you might want to go back to the original play that I created. So there you go. What do you think, Chris? Pretty neat looking. You want, you want one of these? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll make you one. Awesome. Okay. All right. So that's about it for me and spelunking in the tech cave. What do you got going on, Chris? Okay. It's the print whisperer. Yay. And the tip of the day. And so we've talked a lot about um, heated beds before on the show, right? So we've talked about what they do. Um, so what, what does a heated bed do? It basically keeps the body of your print a consistent temperature so that the material that's being laid down on top is is not cooling too rapidly and then what that does is that keeps the print from curling because plastic likes to curl if you if you cool plastic down too quickly um and it goes from the the tg or the glass transition temp if you want to get into the uh material physics um you go from you go from glass transition to uh you know a crystallized uh structure that's what plastics do so it basically goes from like this rubbery paste like if you go too quickly it shrinks too quickly and it'll curl up and that's what plastic likes to do plastic shrinks and so that's essentially what the heated bed does that's all it really is there to do is is it it cause it you use it so that your your material will adhere better to the bed but it's adhering better to the bed because it's causing it to not shrink and not not curl up at the edges and it, that's why it causes it to to have better bed adhesion that's why you get better bed adhesion with a heated bed and so 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 that we we know that so i've run into a problem though where my model then is so locked onto the bed because I run a, a the PEI build sheets, the PEI PET. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's PEI. PEI build sheet from Lulzbot, right? Super super sticky stuff when you print a big print on my Taz Five. I don't know if you can see it over here printing. It's printing a big giant fixture for manufacturing right now, and uh, so. I get these giant prints and then they don't when after the bed cools off it do, they don't want to release from the bed so they they're a pain and you can actually break the the parts as you're trying to fidget them off the bed or whatever so i have a tip for you heat your bed up to about 60 c 
depending on what you're printing. You can, you have to play around with this a little bit, but I heat my bed up after, after my bed cools off, I heat it up to about 60, 60 C. And then I use the, I use the handy cry cut spatula that Mike gave me. That's right. And Super this thing, what, what you do is you go around the edges and you just kind of peel up the edges real gradually and make sure your bed is hot. Like 60 C is, is perfect. What I found for me is perfect. Peel up the edges and then just work your way to the middle. And that will make your, your prints will come off like that. A lot easier than trying to, to pull them off cold. So heat your bed up and that'll make it easier for stuff to, uh, to come off and go and get yourself one of these Amazon. Five ninety nine. It's a super tool from Crycut. We'll have a link the to it in the show notes. Six dollars you'll ever spend. It's a really handy tool. I'll tell you that. It really, really, really is. It's better than the clam knife that Lulzbot includes. I think Lulzbot actually should include these uh, with their kit go. now. Lulzbot, real good. There's a tip from the Print Whisper. Include that from now on. It's probably cheaper than a clam knife. Um, totally agree with you, Chris. Um, if I may add a couple of my own um, experiences. One thing I found, because as you know, I use the Polymax, which is a PLA, which is softer when it's melted. I found that I like to do the same thing, but then it has a tendency to distort the, <laughs> the actual object because it's still soft. So I have this slab of marble, as you know, it's pretty cold. Um, it does not translate heat very well. So I then take my parts immediately, especially if there's flat surfaces, and lay it on that so that they cool down and on a flat surface, marble, at least the piece I have is fairly flat, and it ensures that I don't have any curvature uh, after pulling it off the bed. So that would be my little tip on that. You know, something I haven't tried yet, but this was mentioned by um, our good friend from uh, Ultimecker, the, what do they call himself? I want to say CEO, but he has another title for it. But he's one of the founders. Remember Eric? Yeah. Eric mentioned that you should just take um, one of those compressed airs, but uh, where the temperature is lower. And he says what happens is that the parts just pop off. Now, I haven't tried that personally, and maybe that only works with a glass bed. But he says by cooling or the part quickly, it just literally snaps off the bed. What do you think of that idea? Have you ever tried it? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know. I think it would crack the glass, but who knows? Um, I haven't ever tried it. I Like you, I use my little, what did you call it again? What was Cry, it cut. Cry cut. Cry um, cut. Yep. That's the bestest tool. All right. I think we're on to the calendar, aren't you? Uh, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. We're coming to the tail end here. Here we are. We're actually, gosh, only an hour and a half. That's that's great on our part, isn't it? All right, so calendar is behind me. We are in the month of May now. What do we got going on? Well, if you're in Turkey, May through 5 through 7 is the 3D Print Expo in Turkey. And as we've talked about before, they have gone around to several countries. Uh, and obviously, they continue to do so. If you are in Australia on 11th through 13th, you have Inside 3D Printing in Sydney. And then obviously Rapid. You've talked about this show before, right? Through 16th through the 19th in May, which is now in Orlando. And none of these shows identify their pricing at this point. Um, some of them can be quite expensive, so keep that in mind. I'm going to push out a little further. Make May 20th. Fair. Make <laughs> her fair. Sadly, I probably will not go this year. Actually, you know, I'll have to think about that. Um, I actually spent three days at Maker Faire last year and wore myself out. Um, didn't get that many views on my live uh, interviews and so forth. So I may skip it. I don't know. Chris, if you're going to go, maybe we should talk about it. Maker Faire is a huge event. As Chris has alluded to when he went there the year before, and then I went last year, lots to cover, a lot of stuff uh, in a lot of different areas. They had a virtual reality section, which was kind of cool. They actually, it was in the dark area that was all lit up with uh, um, 
what do you want to call it, ultraviolet illuminated objects and so forth. Pretty neat. I had some footage on that. They had a, a uh, 3D fabricated prosthetics. Um, what do you call it? Um, fashion show, which I thought was pretty cool. They had a number of models um, that uh, had lost a limb uh, showing off their very aesthetically pleasing prosthetics. thought that was kind of cool. Um, they had several uh, 3D printer companies there. They had a pavilion set up specifically for that. And uh, they had, uh, obviously, my friends over at the MedX, which they probably won't be doing this year. But they had a little booth and all kinds of stuff. Gosh, it kept me busy for a few days. So if you're needing a reason to come to California, I can't think of a better reason. It's a fun carnival type activity, lots of carnival type food uh, for the geek. Wouldn't you agree? Very, very much agree. Okay, so let's look on to the events road to VR. And uh, actually there's not much identified. Uh, as mentioned, I went to the the Silicon Valley VR Expo and covered that. Not a big event, but uh, if you were in the Silicon Valley area. Another event, uh, which is not shown here, and I'll just mention it, so if you can put it on your calendar, in June, and I don't have a date, is AWE. And I covered that last year, and I felt actually um, that was a fairly nice show. This was done at the Santa Clara Convention Center. And it specifically catered to augmented, but they had a special area just for virtual reality. Um, if you remember, this was the opportunity for doing my brief interview with Amir. And uh, back then when he said, oh, it'll be available in October 2015, which it wasn't. Boo-hoo. And, uh, oh, well, one other item. I know I'm boring you, Chris. I can see it. I had one other thing that I wanted to mention. While I was up in the Bay Area, I went to Alcatraz. And one of my objectives there is to create a VR experience that I want to call Life at Alcatraz. So essentially, the idea is to create a cell and an accurate cell. And here's a, a screen capture of what I captured uh, using the occipital 3D scanner uh, with my iPhone 6S Plus through the bars. So I literally just kind of moved it around because some of the cells, especially those that actually had a bed and other items, was completely closed off. But because of the compactness of my scanner, I was able to move it around and actually capture this. My goal is to make a model of this as accurate as possible. And like the being uh, Van Gogh, this is going to be called Life at Alcatraz. And you'll be able to sit there and contemplate all the wrongdoings in your life as you <laughs> are confined to a cell. Uh, another idea I'm looking at uh, working with a guy out of India who has created the whole environment of Alcatraz. So create like a scenario where you're laying down, you'll be told to lay down in your VR world. And then when you open your eyes, you find that your door cell your, has been opened but everybody has disappeared. So essentially, you have Alcatraz to yourself. Maybe ghosts from the past will come and talk to you about Alcatraz. Who knows? But uh, obviously, it spurred my creativity after visiting Alcatraz. Chris, have you ever been to Alcatraz? Uh, God, when I was a kid. Yeah, not for many, many years. Yeah. Well, it's it actually, I guess, is a huge... Uh, tourist attraction and uh, lots of people from many countries there uh, was surprising to see the number of models available online uh, from people from around the world so I guess it it's been a significant uh, little island for a number of people it's made its mark um, I actually had an opportunity when we were there to actually see a prisoner the last surviving prisoner of Alcatraz who had written a book. We bought the book, and Siobhan has a picture of uh, with the guy. So. And he went back to Alcatraz? Yep. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> huh? I'm sorry? Is it Alcatraz? 
Yeah, he was at Alcatraz signing his books yeah, in the bookstore. Or the, what do you want to call it? The uh, novelty or the gift shop. Yep. Wow. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'll give an update as I finish this up in the next few weeks. But uh, yeah, there's some interesting little banners that were identified there. One is Indians Allowed uh, was like written on the wall, uh, Alcatraz on the outside. So uh, we'll see. But I uh, thought it was a fun experience and thought I would digitize and try and create a little VR experience, you know, to contemplate all the wrongdoings in your life as you sit with life at Alcatraz. All right, Chris, why don't you sign us off? Well, thanks everybody for joining us on all things 3D. And uh, we will see you next week on another episode of All Things 3D. Hey, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment, Chris. Um, let me find myself here. So, James, you didn't join us, but I want to wish you a happy birthday. Um, his birthday was on May 4th, so hopefully it was a good one. And uh, hopefully you can join us again soon. Happy birthday, buddy. Happy birthday. Bye.